Hello, and welcome to Central Booking, where writers and readers are the authority. I'm your host, John Valeri. October is LGBTQ History Month, and I can think of no better way to commemorate the occasion than by sitting down with author and advocate Sarah Prager. Full disclosure, we recorded this in July, so points for proactivity. Sarah's most recent book, Rainbow Revolutionaries, 50 LGBTQ People Who Made History, was published earlier this year. Written for middle graders, it offers biographical sketches of dozens of influential individuals who were pioneers of the movement. You know, before it was a movement. As the San Francisco Chronicle said, conquerors and conductors, artists and athletes, dancers and doctors, techies and showbiz types. Together they emerged from the shadows of history into present light. And each entry is coupled with a vibrant, historically accurate illustration by Sarah Papworth. Rainbow Revolutionaries was both a junior library guild selection and one of Time Out's LGBTQ books for kids to read during Pride Month. Sarah's previous book, Queer There and Everywhere, 23 People Who Changed the World, received three starred reviews and was named a Best Book for Teens by both the New York Public Library and the Chicago Public Library. Let me just pause for a moment to say that I first met Sarah at Connecticut's incomparable Book Club Bookstore, now known as Book Club on the Go. They have both books in stock, along with signed book plates, and would be happy to hook you up, so I'll drop the links in the video description. But back to Sarah. In addition to her books, her writing has been published in numerous outlets including The Atlantic, HuffPost, Bustle, and The Advocate. In 2013, she created KIST, a free mobile app for learning LGBTQ history, and in 2014 was invited to the White House to contribute on LGBTQ tech issues. As an advocate and educator, she has now presented LGBTQ history to more than 140 groups across five countries. If you haven't already had the privilege of hearing her speak, you're about to. It's my honor to introduce a rainbow revolutionary in her own right, Sarah Prager. Hi, everybody. Today, I am in conversation with author and activist Sarah Prager, whose new book is The Very Colorful Rainbow Revolutionary. As you can see it on both our screens, oh, there's the book. Welcome to the show, Sarah. Thanks for being here. Oh, thanks so much for having me, John. It's my pleasure. You know, I've wanted to, well, actually, before COVID, you know, I never thought I would have a virtual show. Um, yeah. But my friend, Chris Wallach, one of the book cooters, interviewed you a couple of years ago, and it was yeah. such an interesting, enlightening conversation that I always, you know, thought in the back of my mind, if ever there was an occasion, I would love to, you know, chat with you somehow, and, you know, our virtual lives sort of made that a possibility, so I'm really glad that we get to sit down and do this today. Um, yeah. And I thought I would start by asking you, because when Chris was in conversation with you, you had a book out, um, Queer There and Everywhere, which was written for teenagers. You're going to hold it up, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I got that too. That's awesome. And you know what? I have to say, like, you have the best titles. <laughs> um, oh, thank you. And also, people oh, don't say, totally you know, say don't judge a book by the cover, but look at your covers. They're amazing. Like, why would you not want well, to? Well, I'm very lucky to have wonderful illustrators and art directors. Um, the titles I totally, I put out on my Facebook um, profile, what should I name this book? And a Facebook friend commented with Rainbow Revolutionaries, and um, I think my dad might have come up with Queer There and Everywhere. Um, he's kind of a pun master, so. Um. <laughs> I love a good pun, or a bad pun, maybe yeah. open puns, but gold stars for them, because they're really, you know, great titles, and I think that that does help. Um, yeah. But, you know, obviously I figured, let's start at the beginning. So Rainbow Revolutionaries came out, I believe, in May. It's your new book. Um, yeah. It's written for a middle grade audience. Yeah. So can you tell me what inspired you to write this book, particularly for them? And also, you know, why now seems to be a very relevant time um, for this topic? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I Queer There and Everywhere is what inspired Rainbow Revolutionaries. So I have to kind of go back and... Um, what inspired Queer There and Everywhere, which is um, a young adult book about um, the true stories of 23 people from LGBTQ history. Uh, for me, growing up in Simsbury, Connecticut, I, I came out as lesbian when I was 14. And throughout high school, I started teaching myself LGBTQ history. Thankfully, my school library um, was actually even helpful with that at that time. So uh, 
I got so much from learning that history. It helped to develop my sense of identity and my sense of community. It helped me feel um, less alone and it helped me feel, um, it showed me role models. I felt connected to these people that I was learning about. And, you know, when I thought this would be perfect, um, you know, as I got older, I was like that, the isolated LGBTQ youth out there who don't have someone to connect with, um, they, like I did, can connect with these historical figures. Like, I can relate to their stories. I can see myself reflected in these stories. And so if we don't have the characters in um, fiction to represent us, which, um, you know, when I was in high school, that was... 20 years ago now, um, there, there wasn't um, that representation really out there in a positive way, at least. And um, so it gave me so much. And so I wanted to bring those stories in an engaging way written for younger people instead of the academic um, books that I had read. And when I realized I couldn't fit all the stories that I wanted to into the format of Queer There and Everywhere, that's what kind of inspired Rainbow Revolutionaries because by writing one page per person, um, you know, each person has a, a, a spread of a one-page portrait and a one-page bio, um, that allowed me to tell so many more um, underrepresented stories because um, sometimes the facts to be able to fill a full queer there and everywhere style chapter that needs quotes and anecdotes and um, detail and stories and emotion, uh, it just didn't exist for people like Francisco Mani Congo who was brought as an enslaved person um, from Africa to Brazil in the 1500s. We know so little about their story and so much so that I was not able to create a full queer there and everywhere chapter for that person. And telling stories like Francisco's is part of why um, I wanted to try a new format. Um, and with just a one, just needing a few paragraphs about a person, I was able to tell that story in Rainbow Revolutionaries. So um, that's part of what was behind it. Besides, of course, wanting to reach um, a middle grade audience, which is just the perfect age to start kind of questioning what you've been taught um, in history class, I think. Sure. And actually, I'm going to jump to that because that was going to be a question that I got to a little I, bit. I think I answered like five questions in that because I, I rambled totally a bit. I got a little things. excited. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, they do all sort of meld together. Um, but I'm sure there's a couple of things we can expand on. But yeah, you know, reaching a teenage audience or even maybe more importantly, a middle-aged audience. Yeah. Um, can you expand a little bit on why this is a really good time uh, to reach children and beyond that, you know, the people who are working with children, living with children, loving with children who might be reading this book as well? Yeah. So, I mean, the average age for um, somebody to come out has been dropping um, over time um, to the point where it is now middle school. Um, and so youth are, are discovering themselves and their friends are discovering themselves and they're starting to get to know out LGBTQ people, maybe themselves, um, sometimes for the first time in middle school. And so I wanted, um, I heard so much from readers in Queer There and Everywhere. I wish I had known this even earlier. Like, I feel like I've missed out on so much um, that's been hidden from me. And now I'm learning it. Even teens feel like this is too late to be learning about this for the first time. So I wanted youth to be able to grow up already knowing that incredible LGBTQ people have contributed to the world um, throughout all of human history. And I didn't want that to ever be new information, but something that, that you've learned from a young age. And so going younger was... Um, partly for that. I also think, like I s started to say, like you said, um, I think middle schoolers are 
ready to start learning the, the skills that should be being taught in history classes of questioning sources and things like that. You're starting to think more analytically than just being given information that you have to repeat back in elementary school. And that analytical thinking um, can apply to, you know, maybe questioning what you were taught in, in elementary school. So was Christopher Columbus really a hero or like right. those ways that things have been presented? You're old enough to start thinking for yourself, uh, was he a hero and that kind of thing. So um, I also think uh, it's now, it, there's always an age appropriate way to talk about gender and sexuality. There's really no age um, too young. It's just about um, the, the wording and the presentation. So while I got really deep into the romantic lives of people for in a teen book, um, that's not really something I went into in these one page bios for younger kids. So, um, middle schoolers are absolutely ready to, to start learning about um, LGBTQ people if they haven't already. Sure, and I think too, you know, the book is or can be such a great resource um, for adults. Can, you know, ideally, can you talk about how, you know, teachers and parents can really use this book to relate to their children? Yeah, um, yeah, so many adults were, you know, any adult now was not raised learning LGBTQ history in school. Whether they were ever learned it outside of school is probably unlikely if they're not part of the LGBTQ community. So um, many adults don't know this to be able to teach it. So um, this is a really easy intro for people of any age to just kind of gloss through um, and, you know, Rainbow Revolutionaries has 50 people from around the world and hopefully it gives just a sense of the breadth of this history, the, the scope of, um, you know, there's people from Iran and China and um, Botswana and like, people are like, oh, there was LGBTQ history there. And because if they learned any, it might just be U.S. or Western centric. So uh, I think it it's ready to open the minds of, of anybody who hasn't had access to this education in their lifetime, regardless of their age. And there's also some really great um, back matter in this book, some bonus content beyond the 50 mini bios. There's also a timeline of LGBTQ history. There's a glossary of LGBTQ terms. There's um, illustrations of all the different pride symbols and pride flags. And so it's a, it, it does have a lot of great um, 101 and beyond for, for parents, educators, or any interested adults. Sure. And, you know, reading it myself, it was just, I read it in a night because it was so fascinating. And there were so many names that I knew, but also so many names that I didn't know. And as you said, you know, worldwide representation, and it really just the breadth, um, you know, of these people and what they were known for, you know, it's yeah. ast astronauts and doctors and politicians. It's just exactly. incredible. Um, that diversity is part of what I was trying to show where I wasn't just, just trying to have racial diversity or, um, you know, represent all sexual orientations and gender identities. And while that was important, I also was looking for diversity of field and geography and era. So I wanted to show people from the BC era. I wanted to show, I mean, like you said, it's astronauts, it's doctors. So the whole idea is that you get the sense that LGBTQ people can be anyone. And um, it's especially powerful for middle schoolers who are figuring out who they want to be. Um, when they see that representation of, I could grow up to be a politician, I could grow up to be an activist, I could grow up to be a scientist. Um, you know, the, the inventor of um, satellite radio is in there, um, the inventor of the high five is in there, there are athletes, there's just, um, 
hopefully it gives any reader the sense that they can grow up to be anything they want to be because all of these people had to fight against discrimination and stuff and and still made it so um i hope it gives a sense you know you can too sure and uh you mentioned too you know that there's some sort of bonus enrichment content at the back of the book and there's a really you know, great glossary. And I'm thinking maybe we should just take a minute to actually, you know, talk about some of the terminology because sure. we were talking about 20 years ago when you were a high schooler and so was I, it was, it was basically, you know, people identified as straight, gay, maybe yeah. bisexual, you know, um, maybe, yeah. really expanded a lot, um, even just in the last 20 years. And I think that people our age, people older than us, um, you know, maybe a bit confounded by LGBTQ, you know. IA2S plus, yeah. <laughs> well, there's more, right? <laughs> plus, plus, plus. Oh, there, there is so much more. You can, I've seen LGBTQQIA2S, um, like the number two is even in there beyond letters. So um, yeah, we can totally talk about some of those. So 2S um, is probably new to a lot of people. That stands for two-spirit, um, which is a Native American identity um, that comes from, you know, male and female spirits ex existing in one person. And so it's under the umbrella of um, transgender identities. And it's something that has existed in dozens and dozens, almost all Native American tribes from Canada to Chile um, have had or still have um, like documented third genders, fourth genders, just entirely different structures of gender than the colonizers did. And um, two-spirit is a more modern term that encompasses those dozens of um, trans-native identities. So that's one of them. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And I think, you know, it's so important, too, that knowledge really is power and people still are scared of what they don't know. But what a simple way to, you know, I mean, it's a great primer for kids and for adults. And I think that there's so much empowerment in, in knowing these things. Um, so terrific book. And I do have to ask you because the uh, illustrations are phenomenal. I mean, the book is like a veritable rainbow, like the colors pop. Yeah. It's, it's really, really amazing. And Absolutely, the I opened to the glossary and there's like even a little rainbow border yeah. around even the text pages. Yeah. 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 Sarah Papworth illustrated the book. So I'm wondering, did you have any collaboration with her or no? And a lot, actually. Yeah. yeah I because I know, know some people don't get to do that. I know. And in Queer There and Everywhere, you know, we were kept really separate. I never really got to talk to that illustrator. I got to give some feedback. You know, it's it's a very lightly illustrated book, but each um uh each chapter does have a little black and white bust sketch of the person but um for for this one I was so lucky to be it we did collaborate a lot um and the art director Allison um Clapworth Clappor um Allison uh also you know was a huge part of that in kind of the communication between me and Sarah so I was kind of the person who, it was really interesting to give edits on art instead of text, sure. but it was, that's what it was. She would send over a sketch and I would say, well, actually, um, you know, so for this Native American person, um, you know, not all Native Americans are like the same. So like, we don't want a totem pole. We don't want a teepee. Like those were not at all part of um, this person's world. So uh, the research behind accurate um, symbology and landscape and everything for this person who's from what's today New Mexico, um, just a totally different world than the Plains or the Pacific Northwest. So like, uh, you know, this is um, a specific design um, to the Zuni people um, who this person and their tribe were known for pottery. 
Um, so you see this is kind of southwestern U.S. style, and um, this necklace is in an actual um, photograph of this person. Uh, and so there, yeah, there was a lot on that kind of thing, and that's, those details just, for me, I mean, brought my excitement for the project to a whole other level, but like, so Alvin Ailey, the dance choreographer and dancer, this, these dancers are doing part of his most famous dance piece, and this is how they're costumed, and, and all of that, and then for each person, the illustrated borders of the text have symbols um, from their life. So the hands from that dance scene are mirrored there, but, um, you know, here's Frida Kahlo, there's a paintbrush, um, you know, these flowers that appear in her paintings, uh, and, I mean, Harvey Milk has um, his megaphone, a Harvey Milk campaign button, um, a camera for his camera shop. Um, I think, and those are the three symbols repeated around this illustrated border. So, yeah, I would give the illustrator what those symbols should be. Sometimes give feedback on uh, that camera would not be a 1970s camera if I had just said camera. And so I would send over photos for her to work off of. And yeah, there was a ton of collaboration because it is so heavily illustrated. And that is telling the story of the history just as much as the text. So um, yeah, it was, it was a whole new experience compared to Queer There and Everywhere because throughout editing and everything, there were edits on the, the art in addition to the text. So that was um, new for me. Yeah, that's awesome because, you know, even now I'm like, oh, I think I have to go back and pay a little bit more attention because, you know, you take so much of that for granted and you don't necessarily think to look at the, the pottery or the architecture or... Yeah, let me, I know I already gushed about it a bit, but I just, one of my favorites is Sylvia Rivera, um, the famous trans activist who founded an organization with an acronym STAR. And that's why she has stars all over yeah, awesome. um, hers is um, to represent her and Marsha's organization, Star. So yeah, it's so great. And you know, I have to ask you because I feel like you know, in the book world, or maybe in the reading world, not necessarily the book world, but people again take for granted, um, you know, writing or illustrating for children and mm -hmm. for a younger audience, and they think, well, oh, it's so easy. Um, and you have written for children, teens, adults, you know, you've pretty much covered the gamut. And I find that a lot of people find writing for children much more difficult. So can you just, can you talk to that experience? Yes. Um, so I needed to research these people um, just as much as I did for, um, regardless of how much you're writing about them, to know what you're going to write, um, you need to have done, um, you need to, to know what the best little bits of the story are to, to take out and include in that one page. You want the very best and maybe never heard of before, especially for bigger names. Um, you want to be presenting something new that hasn't um, been out in people's consciousness. So um, you need to dig even deeper. And while, um, I mean, yeah, it, it took me, less time to write Rainbow Revolutionaries. Um, it is less text, um, but the finding the 50 people was also something that took a lot of time and research. Um, when, you know, I was like, oh, I don't have anyone to represent this entire region, and so I would just look at all the possible names for that part of the world and um, you know, get books about the, his the LGBTQ history of that part of the world and see if I could find a specific name and then, you know, make sure it wasn't just based on rumor and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then once you find the person, um, the research begins on that person. And then, so, um, yeah, there's, 
uh, for nonfiction like this, 50 biographies was um, plus the timeline and everything else. It is, um, it's a serious project, um, but it was, I mean, it was an absolute joy. Like it's my dream job, of course. Like to be honest, writing Queer There and Everywhere was the hardest thing I've ever done. It was like pulling teeth. I was like, I turned in chapter after chapter that was like rejected by the editor because it was sounding too academic instead of YA voice. Right. And I was like trying to get this voice and I was trying and like, it was so hard. And by the time it came to write Rainbow Revolutionaries, I don't know if it was because I went through that boot camp, but um, to write this one was a joy and a breeze. And I, I wish I could write it a thousand times over. It was so fun. I love just finding people I had never heard of still. Um, and, uh, and then being able to share their stories with other people who have never heard them about them. So, um, yeah, writing for, um, no matter if you're writing about history, you have a lot of research to be doing. Then when you translate it into the length and the voice and whatever uh, for your audience, that's, that's just the writing. But you, um, there's a lot of work outside of that. Sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, let me ask that too because you know people know you for your books but you have written for years and years and years and you've written for adults and like you said you've written very academic pieces and if people go to your website you know they can look up your articles and I mean it is a lot it's very impressive I'm like how does she do it and have kids and sleep maybe you don't sleep I don't know um, yeah I used to not sleep um then I have had kids and I really didn't sleep um, now our youngest is turning one next week, so um, we're starting to get sleep back in our lives, but actually so much of the, the articles that you'll see on my website right now have been written um, in the last six months because um, my wife has been unemployed taking care of the kids because of the pandemic, and we don't feel safe sending them back to daycare even though it just reopened, so um, she's been home with the kids and I guess I just write all day and I am just churning out um like everything I ever wanted to write and um I just I love it I come up with ideas I pitch it I find the right place and then we go with it so um some of the articles are are deeper looks at people that I or eras that I found um or you know I'm not the discoverer but um you know, it piqued my interest and I wanted to write more than about this one person. So like for JSTOR Daily, I did uh, the, the, his, the bisexual history of Han Dynasty China. And um, it's maybe it's like 2000 words, which is a lot more than one page about one person from that era for Rainbow Revolutionaries. So I got to look deeper and um, do an interesting feature on something a lot of people don't know about. Um, almost all of the emperors of Han Dynasty China had wives and official male companions um, who were openly their boyfriends. And uh, that, was, that was the norm for um, the court in that time. So um, 2000 years ago. So um, I, I've also done like some, like just the stories of individuals. And then right now I'm doing just some lists of like eight by women from history or I, today eight queer parents from history went up. Um, and yeah, just lots of little, um, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, there's so many sides to this field to tell, and um, I love it. I, and, and I love coming up with the new voices, because some will be like a pop culture kind of website where they are looking for like a listicle kind of thing, and then some are more academic, and um, you still want to have a narrative voice and not be boring, even though it is academic. And um, yeah, I, it's... It's been really nice to be home together, um, thankfully. And um, I mean, we'll see how 
how long it lasts. I think our last uh, little federal bonus payment is this week and I'll just, you know, keep writing as much as I can for right. now. Yeah. I know, talk about adapting to the times, but you know, in addition to all your writing too, I did want to ask you, you know, you are used to, you know, you travel extensively. Now you're traveling virtually. So even though you're home, I mean, like right now you're here with me, but you're doing all kinds of things, yeah. uh, libraries and schools and organizations um, all over the place, not just, you know, in Massachusetts where you are, or yeah. um, you can really travel the world. So can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, how you're able to keep up sort of those virtual visitations and yeah. what you get out of that personally? But on the other hand, I would assume, you know, for someone like you who's become sort of a spokesperson and very representative of the movement, it must also be difficult because people, you know, feel very comfortable sharing with you. And that has to probably be a lot, I would think, to take on. It can be. Um, so for promoting Rainbow Revolutionaries, all my library talks got moved online. And it's been really interesting because some people who have come to them are from entirely different states because they uh, just saw there's a talk on this topic for my age kid happening at a time that I can do. And, you know, it's out on Facebook, the website, and you can pop in from anywhere. And so that's been a positive of um, moving everything online is how many the it, it instantly becomes global, um, regardless of the town that you're speaking for. Um, it's also been nice, you know, I spoke online to a library in Connecticut last month. I mean, several, but um, then just last night, I did... Um, a similar talk for a Girl Scout troop because um, one of the girls from that troop and her mom had been at the library talk and they thought it would be cool for me to do a talk on um, women's stories, um, LGBTQ women's stories from history for their Girl Scout troop. So I, I spoke to a bunch of 12 year old girls last night um, for a troop in Connecticut who can't really see each other right now, but they came together for an online event. So. Um, that was really nice, but also, yeah, I, when I speak every once in a while, somebody will follow up, um, through the contact form on my website or something like that and say, you know, I have this question or, um, problem or things like that. And, um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be involved in the community and to, to help where I can. Um, it's not an overwhelming amount to take on. Um, and I, I do say yes almost all the time to people who ask me for like help with a high school paper on an LGBTQ history topic or things like that because it just it means so much to me if a student reaches out and is interested. I, I want to foster that as much as I can. Um, and it's not at such a volume that I can't um, usually say yes. Um, and so, I mean, that's, that's wonderful. You know, people have written to me from like Australia and places where we just, yeah, we don't, I, I've spoken virtually to an Australian LGBTQ history conference, for example, um, but I haven't been as an adult. Um, I, I actually came out to myself in Australia at, in middle school because I was on a school trip where we did a three-week exchange. Wow. And um, so a friend came out to me uh, while we were in Australia on this exchange and her saying that she liked girls made me realize that a girl liking girl was, girls was like possible. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's an option? Oh my gosh, a little light bulb, and I figured it out. And um, so Australia is like a special to me, but I, you know, I haven't presented there, and yet I've reached people there. So it's it's great to not have to physically be there and still connect with people. Um, but yeah, pre-pandemic, I did get to present in person in Mexico, Germany, the UK, um, fifteen-ish states around the U.S., West Coast, East Coast, South, Midwest, um, 
and I, I would love to be doing like a fall college tour yeah. or something, but um, I mean, maybe next year, who knows? Cross your fingers on that. But yeah. it's cool to be able to reach all these people and then you realize, you know, we really all are not that different regardless yeah. of who we are, where we are, how we identify, like it's the same issues. Mm -hmm. um, but let me ask you too, you know, you talked about your coming out experience and you, you know, become a very enthusiastic, passionate advocate. Can you talk about one, you know, how you started to find your voice and the courage to do that, but also, you know, the advice that you would give to other people who are sort of struggling, not necessarily only the people who identify as LGBTQ, but also the people who just want to support, you yeah. know, that community. Yeah, thanks for that question. I think, um, I mean, how I personally found the courage, I mean, it, it's all about the the support some of it privilege um that i received my um parents have always been supportive my whole family's always been supportive um i you know i was, I was lucky to grow up in connecticut um where we yeah my wife and i were able to get married when we wanted because we lived in um massachusetts and it was it was a non-issue for many things and i've always worked for progressive nonprofits. it's not and then i've worked for myself where being out was almost a requirement not a hindrance mm -hmm. so um and publishing it and everything has come so far um even since when i first came out 20 years it's going to be 20 years um, and wow, it's going to be 20 years, like this year. Wow. Um, there has to be a cake for that. Huh? There has to be a cake for that. Right? Yes. Good. Oh my gosh. Well, I have kids birthday parties where, and we had a cake for my book launch and stuff. They're all like alone just for my family to eat cake at home <laughs> because there's no parties anymore, but, um, we still get a cake. Uh, picked up some mix today um, for next week, but um, I think, yeah, I've been I've been lucky and I've been privileged to um, have the support and acceptance that made it was like, well, being yourself, it's just like being. We want you to be proud to be a girl. We want you to be, you know, proud of everything that makes you you and. Um, that's that's just always been easy in in my life. I've I've ex I've experienced homophobia um, many times over the years and in some ways daily. But it's um, I mean I just I don't know if it was like I went to an all girls school and. Um, that was really big on instilling confidence in young women. And um, I was just, I don't know, my parents are, cared about activism and encouraged me to, to do that. Um, you know, LGBTQ rights wasn't what they were activists for, but, um, you know, it was like more environmentalism and, um, or anti-war and things like that. Um, and yeah it, it was they also helped we 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 had free housing free food free kind of everything through my dad's job growing up at that he was a teacher at that girls school which is why i got to go there for free which is why i got to go there and so yeah not paying for housing and all of that allowed us to travel and I got to grow up. Um, my parents both worked in schools, so summer vacations, spring breaks. We, we got to travel the world um, as, as young kids and it really helped to form my mind um, about there just being different cultures than, and the all girls school too is a private boarding school with um, many international students, many students on scholarship, many students from all over the country, and 
all different backgrounds. And so um, I was just, even though I was in Connecticut, I, I've just always been provided with like a global viewpoint by my upbringing that it just helps so much. But my advice would be, um, I mean, for finding self-confidence and um, strength, I mean, I get so much of it for my community and I think anybody who has access to be online now has access to that community. And so whether it's on like TikTok or anywhere like that for um, young people or, um, you know, you can, Mm. I, I, I wish I had, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure I've answered this question before and that it's been better, but believing in yourself has to come from within and I, I think, um, yeah, it, loving yourself and encouraging others to love themselves is, um, it's a journey for folks and I don't, I, and it's important and I support people all um, going through that, but I, I don't know that I have like a, a magic um, solution to how to achieve that huge thing. If only, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean. You wouldn't have to worry about money, you'd be okay. Yeah. <laughs> Bottle that, but you know, um, one of the things that you said is, you know, you were very fortunate as a young person to sort of have a global experience. And I think that, you know, that's something that you provide in this book because you don't have to leave your home to experience all these influential people throughout history and i think the great thing is that you know the younger people learn about people who are different than themselves or who are just like themselves you know it's easier to understand it's easier to embrace um, yeah. and you can do that even through something as simple as reading a book um, yeah. But I wanted to follow up on something else that you said too, because you were talking about how there's this, you know, great community now um, and a great supportive community online. And I think that, you know, given the circumstances of our times, you know, the pandemic and the uncertainty that we're all living through and the fact that so many of us are social distancing, I know that isolation can be particularly difficult for people who've already felt like they've been isolated or had to hide who they are. So can you just, to those people, can you talk to them a little bit about how they can, uh, you know, embrace this online community where they might be able to find people and make those connections um, if they are feeling lonelier and more isolated than typically? Well, I mean, on, finally, the first thing that just came to my mind was um, reaching out to a local library because they are doing a lot. I've been speaking to so many libraries and so many of them have their own like LGBT youth groups and things like that. So I wouldn't hesitate to check with um, a teen librarian if you're a teen or, you know, the appropriate person um, to see what kind of programming they're doing because I've felt a lot of kinship kind of being in a Zoom room with people talking about this. And I know participants are sometimes, you, you get to hear the other participants and um, they are doing social stuff, not just educational, right. um, you know, a PowerPoint from somebody like me. Um, they are doing just like, oh, we used to meet up in person, now we're meeting up online. And so there are still groups to join like that. There's also, um, you know, especially for anyone in Connecticut, but this, it's put out by True Colors in Connecticut, but it's accessible to anyone who can access YouTube. Um, True Colors has always done um, the, the largest LGBT youth conference annually. They always held it um, at UConn. And this past year, they um, had people do video workshops and they put it all on their YouTube. So that's an organization, True Colors, that besides that YouTube content to hear from different people, um, they have a mentorship program and other things that I'm sure they're continuing 
through, um, you know, making it digital instead of in person. Uh, so I, that's a great organization to work out to, reach out to. I think all organizations that serve LGBT youth are finding ways to serve them online right now. I think if you Google LGBT youth support group near me, wherever you are, um, especially in New England, there's likely to be something. Um, and for anyone in crisis, there's the Trevor Project. And um, so they have a hotline, but they also have ways for youth to connect to each other online. Um, Trevor Space, I think it's called. I'm not sure if they actually even still have that, but they would be people who would, um, it gets better project. They would also be happy to help people with resources. And um, yeah, there's so many YouTubers and Instagrammers and people that are just like a great way to have like constant queer content in your life um, through, there's so many great people to follow on social. And if you just look at like, you know, LGBT hashtag um, on, you could be specific, you know, if you're bi or, you know, things like that. But um, yeah, those are some of the places. Awesome. I was going to say, thinking about that, you know, our online lives and social media and hashtags, you must be an influencer now. Like you have... Oh, I don't think so. Not quite. I don't know. Um, I, 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 think... I don't have any blue check marks on <laughs> anywhere. So <laughs> I haven't made it uh, to to that level. I, I'm still trying to get influencers to talk about my books. So I, I think that means I'm not an influencer. Although Chastin Buttigieg, Pete Buttigieg's husband said that they bought Rainbow Revolutionaries and enjoyed it. So I was like, he like liked, a he followed me on Instagram and I was like, do you want a free copy? He was like, oh, I already bought one. Even better. That's like a double win. <laughs> yeah. I, he was like, oh yeah, me and Pete bought it. It's cool. I was like, okay. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Like a geek out moment right there. <laughs> yeah. I was like, yeah, there's a blue check. I was like, no, it's really like a Buddha judge. So that's <laughs> cool. <laughs> well, I don't know. I think you might be an influencer. I think they just have yet to catch up with you. You know, you're just moving yeah, at yes. work speed and they're they're a little behind on the times, but they'll, they'll get there eventually. I wonder if you have to like apply for it or something if they haven't taken notice. I could, I guess I could try, but I have pretty modest followings. <laughs> um, it, yeah, like a few hundred, not a few thousand. Um, on most stuff so yeah, yeah. it's cool <laughs> awesome. i should probably put out a plug too because our friend cindy akato of the book club yeah. bookstore if you live like around the south windsor connecticut area like she'll probably do contact list delivery and she can get you these oh well you know i've been working with cindy so it's um book club on the go is kind of my we have an arrangement where that's one of the only places in the world you can get kind of an autographed copy of my books right now. If you order through her website um, for book club on the go, South Windsor, Connecticut, you um, can order either one, like the entries for my books. They have a place if you want to request a personalized signing. And then she emails me and tells me that a request came in. I fill out a book plate sticker label, mail that to her. She affixes it in the book and then sends it to you. Um, so that's how signings work in a pandemic, I guess. Yeah, that's pretty awesome, though. You know, it's amazing that the accommodations that people can make in Cindy's really, really terrific. Uh, but OK, two more questions, if you don't mind, and then I'll let you get back to your kids, your wife, all that writing that you have to do. Um, but I did want to ask you, you know, about your app because you developed an app that's like the, the history of LGBTQ, but also of HIV. So can you talk a little bit about that um, and let people know how they can find it? Because I think especially, again, when we're all closed in in our houses, that's another great way to occupy your time in an enriching way. Definitely. So it's called QUIST, Q-U-I-S-T, which is kind of short for queer history. And uh, I created it in 2013, so it's been out for quite a while, and it hasn't been 
funded or updated in a few years and it actually went off line for Android phones last year. So it's now only an Apple um, in the Apple App Store for iPhones and iPads. So, um, but it is free there. And if I um, get any funding, we'll put it right back up on Android when we can. But um, it, it shows you what happened today in those histories. So, uh, you know, so like July 1st, 1701, this person is put on trial. July 1st, 2010, this person comes out. Um, and you'll see at least one event for every day of the year. And you can choose to have little push notifications or not for, for it to show you a little history of the day. Or you can just go into it and you can browse and search and anything through it um, if you'd like. And um, that was kind of how I got my start in the LGBTQ history world in 2013, putting that out there as like a little passion project and um, it took off and opened up a lot of doors through it becoming popular. And then um, HarperCollins came to me uh, offering me a book deal for Queer There and Everywhere because of my work with the app. So um, it the app is how I became a writer even, um, not just an author, but I started writing about LGBTQ history at all online as a way to do like guest posts right. on their websites, a lot of unpaid writing of just to promote um, the app, which has always been free. Um, but it ended up kind of paying off with a career in the end. Yeah, that's pretty great. How many people can say their publisher came to them? That's a... I, I still can't believe it. <laughs> it's still like, it's just a dream. All right. So finally, I do have to ask you, so, you know, you are a parent of young children yourself. So, you know, looking at the future generations, what is your greatest hope in, you know, in terms of equality and equal rights? What do you hope that the progression continues to be? I mean, my hope specifically for my own children is that they will live in a world where they're not teased for being part of an LGBTQ family or ever feel uncomfortable or ashamed or anything about that. And sadly, that's not often the case that um, a, a child with same-sex parents will never experience any of those feelings or experiences. So um, that's going to be a very personal barometer for me as I look into the future of if 10 years from now we haven't achieved enough social acceptance that my kids don't feel socially accepted, um, that'll mean I haven't done enough. <laughs> um, and I, I mean, I, being, you know, an LGBTQ person doesn't need to be you know, they can be single or they could be straight if they're trans and then part of the community or they could be in a, um, you know, I know a lot of people who are, you know, bi and married to somebody of a different gender than themselves. And so there are a lot of ways that um, you don't, just but from being LGBTQ, you don't always engage with every LGBTQ specific experience at once and becoming an LGBTQ spouse and then parent has invited a lot of like it's made me see a lot of experiences of how the world is not set up for lgbtq people so um like one of my pet peeves is kind of all the forms that we fill out for our kids they often will ask for mother's information and father's information sure. and it's like years and years and years after marriage equality and they updated the marriage licenses to say party A and party B and they're not asking for like parent one and parent two still right. on school enrollment forms, daycare enrollment forms, um, pediatrician, like the, the systems are just not set up that way. So even if you have accepting pediatricians, people, they see like mom listed and they're like, oh, are you Liz, the mom? 
I'm like, no, I'm Sarah, the mom. Like, you just need to look down further. It's got to be in the notes because it, the database doesn't even let you enter it. So, and same for schools and same, like, there's so many places, swim lessons at the Y, like, all of these places, it's just not set up. Um, and I think that shows the unconscious. These are not um, bigoted, malicious, homophobic people creating or using these forms this it just shows the the unconscious you need to give a second thought to um inclusivity along the way of everything you do and um if you want to make everyone feel accepted and welcomed um which when we encounter a form like that we don't so um yeah i think it, there's so, even if every single law had been changed and every anti-discrimination ordinance was in place, there's a social aspect of everybody needs at even just, um, yeah, these levels of schools and everywhere else that it takes thought um, and intention sometimes. I think that's a really good point because how many of us would actually think about that? Like, if it doesn't apply to us, we don't if think- If it doesn't affect you. And I'm sure there are things that, I, you know, I, I'm able-bodied and, you know, I have all these other, th I'm, I'm hearing, I'm sighted, all of these other things where I'm like, if I was filling these out, would they have a braille form for me, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. where um, you don't necessarily um, think of it if it doesn't affect you and unfortunately that means it falls often to the people who it does affect to speak up about it and um, you don't always want to be especially your first interaction with your kids school or something being the complainer um, or causing trouble or that kind of thing but in the end I, I want to see the, the forms changed and so um, yeah, you say something when you see it. Sure, and it's a good reminder that, you know, just because this is how far we've come, you know, it's still, this is how far we have yet to go, and there's always yeah to be done. Um, but, yeah. All right, I'm going to let you go, but I do have one final question, if you don't okay. mind. You're doing all this writing. Is there a third book percolating? Can you tease anything? I can um, I got tentative news this week oh. of, um, yeah, my third book deal and it has not been signed or announced but um we do have an accepted offer and yeah. it's going to be I'm going just younger and younger it's going to be a picture book this time awesome. yeah um and it'll be the same kind of thing of um telling in shorter and shorter bits of text and more and more illustration um, the stories of some individuals from LGBTQ history. So, um, yeah, elementary this time. That's great. Congratulations. That seems like the perfect progression for your books, you know? I know. I'm just, like, trying to catch up to my kids in time before they get too old. I'm gonna, I was like, well, I want there to be a little board book, but I'm not gonna have a baby to read it to by right, the time they right. come out, but... Uh, <laughs> that's all right by the time they have their own kids if they do exactly yeah, oh on. yes I'm writing for the grandkids now already I have a yes. three-year-old and a one-year-old and just about one year old and I'm already writing for the grandkids all right you're proactive you're a visionary yeah <laughs> yes I have to always seeing forward um yeah <laughs> well, that's how it starts right someone's got to look forward might as well be you and then we follow. So anyway, this is the book, Rainbow Revolutionary. Sarah Prager is the author. Thank you so much for being here today and best Thank of luck. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for all you do. I'm so glad that we connected and I hope you stay safe through all of this. Thanks. Same to you and your family. And I think, you know, when you celebrate your 20 year anniversary of coming out, you should have a virtual cake party where everybody just brings cake to their laptops and then we can all eat it with you. Okay. That sounds perfect. Everyone needs to make their own cake. I'm not mailing slices to anybody, but I can do it. <laughs> That'll be fun. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Take care. That's it for this episode of Central Booking. Thanks for watching, and be sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss a thing.